This would give you one. You could start talking about you and your work before we come to the place. Sit down here. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Peter Ekesa, who is a professor of theater here and uh, a specialist in Asian theater, is just finishing his class because he will come. But, uh, Victor, tell us a bit about you and your work. Well, um, thank you, Frank. Uh, this is, what, maybe my third time, third or fourth time here at the Martin Luther Siegel Center. And uh, what's really been interesting about the work is the piece has been incredibly diff different. I think the first piece was in the Iranian piece and then uh, another Asian piece by Kui Gwen. And so it's nice to be part of this Penn Festival. I'm the artistic director of an Asian American theater company, a 17 year old Asian American theater company called 2G Second Generation. And what we're doing is commissioning plays and musicals to go from incubation to full production. And it actually begins to explore questions like these that are happening in the play. So I think it's very fortuitous that I was invited to be part of this festival that deals with how do you find your sense of Asianness or your sense of self. In, in this particular context. And so even though we only had, let's say, four hours for this play, what we were trying to draw upon was our own understanding of what does it mean to, for like myself, a Filipino immigrant, what does it mean to try to be here in the States? What does it mean, let's say you've had generations, second, third, fourth, fifth generations of your family in this particular country. And for me, I think to put myself in a, in a very simple context, is how do you explore these very, very difficult questions in a translatable way for an audience? Because that's really the question of loneliness, displacement, wanting to feel alive, but within the context of the theater. And I believe that that's the sort of work that I've been trying to explore. And it's, and it's hard. And it's hard. And so what that means is, for me, just like with the actors here today, we've only had four hours was to ask the question of what does this mean to you? Because I don't, I can't really understand in a very, in a very academic or even technical way what these Korean Japanese are going through. But there's the core truth that I can understand and what these actors can understand in any, any particular project. The core truth of, of the question of loneliness question of what's mine and how am I a small figure in a story. Um, and so I do that through plays and musicals and, um, and oftentimes great collaboration. Um, so that's, that's a sort of a short answer. So uh, when you grew up and how did you come to make theater? How, instead of becoming a writer or a painter or do others, how did, how did that all happen? Well, I grew up in the Philippines during the period of Fernand Marx's martial law. So for most of, well, most of the time there, uh, actually about three months after martial law was called, I popped into Kesson City, a hospital there. And, but what happened was there was an arrested sense of uh, the media, arrested sense of what you can say. Um, and then what happened was when I was six years old, I went to California and there was another sort of culture shock akin to the play. The things that you know and understand about a certain world, like home, and then you have to go and understand what the rules are here. Um, and so, what I've been trying to do all my life is try to understand what America means. Right? Just when I thought I knew what the world was supposed to be as a kid, you go and I try to understand what the Bay Area is and how, just like the characters in the play, you begin to acclimate and have master a language. And it's a little bit tricky because the Philippines has a Western veneer, right? You're wearing jeans and you're wearing, you're, you're, you're eating KFC and you have all these sort of Western indicators of success or, or acceptance, but there's this whole other, the multiple layers of culture of 400 years of colonization. And I can only tell you about my life, right? Um, and how then do you begin to navigate this new terrain? And so, because of that, I believe it was a natural thing for me to come to theater. A natural thing for me to have a home and to be able to be in dialogue and understand what the rules are. 
and the context. And so um, I feel like that's been the greatest thing for me because I'm so lost in the world sometimes that when I come to the theater, I can actually have a sense of understanding home or be able to create a context for what home can be even for a few months at a time. And then you go off and you go from this sort of, this theater, this geographic family to a sort of spiritual family, right? And I think that's why, that, that's what drove me to the theater. Um, I can always know that. I thought it was just fun. But now I understand there's a sort of a spiritual link. Or, and you, you did high school theater and then to university, or how was, how did that happen that you? Yeah, I went, I went into high school theater and then university and and I just, and really what I started to do was try to, I started traveling around the country to places like Chicago, and then places like Hoople, North Dakota, and Salt Lake City, and I was just trying to figure out how America ticked. I understood the Hollywood America, but I didn't understand the Hoople, North Dakota America, or the Cleveland, Mississippi America. And so each time I was just trying to, just when I thought I got it, Frank, a whole new set of circumstances, pockets like this, where folks had their own set of rules, their own set of survival skills, uh, and then I would be landing there trying to understand and acclimate and decode that uh, uh, with every new project, whether it's a blue, you know, Blue Ridge Mountains or whether it's, it's even like Chicago South Side, it's just a different set of rules. And, I, and I'm just trying to untie that. And I guess that's part of like what my own personal journey is. Tell us a bit about your Peter Schuppi company, a bit about your, your, the Asian American Theatre Project. I know I once was at Joe's Park, you had this great evening. You know? right. So tell us a bit the challenges, but also the excitement. Um, so 2G is a 17 year old theatre company. That, um, that commissions plays and musicals. And when I took over about a year and a half ago, there we were doing short play for five minute plays, but we were looking inward, trying to build the Asian American community and develop the, the plays and the artists, folks who would be auditioning against each other were suddenly collaborating. So there's a sense of community. And when I took over, I said, well, now that we've been cultivating this for five or six years, let's look outward and how can we begin to create plays that actually start to go out into the world. So instead of, um, let's, let me put in sort of a simple metaphor, like how do you begin to leave Chinatown, right? How do you begin to take these plays and, and begin to have relationships outside of our own enclave? Because we've been developing, we've been looking inward for so long. So what we've been doing now in my tenure is exploring what does it mean to be biracial in America? What does it mean to be in here many, many generations and like with many other cultures, maybe not know what, what the origin story is for, for you, right? Because you, we've now acclimated to all these sets of new rules, the American rules. And then also to explode the notion of what an, Ameri an Asian American play is. One of our commissions by Sung No, who, who started and founded the Mayan Writers Lab uh, is a French uh, musical about a French mathematician. So it begins to explore the notion of what and what Asians can write. How can they be represented in in the in the mainstream theater? And then we also, with that mission of wanting to be part of a mainstream or part of a bigger story, we had to go inward and ask ourselves, who are we marginalizing within our own Asian American community? And so we came up with the Community Voices Project which actually gave playwriting workshops to uh, uh, queer Asian Pacific Islanders because at some point, I'm sure, within our own community, they were ostracized and didn't feel like there was a great um, avenue for their voices. Because actually, I think the thing that we're wrestling with, Frank, is that there's, there's two different paths here, like doctors, lawyers, things that will actually say to us, if we have this level of education, if we have this level of training, no one can touch us. And then if you go the way of the arts, you go to this other path, which is 
all about interpretation. Is the player the story that you write? You know, uh, it means that people can poke holes in it in some, part, some particular way. And that's a dangerous path, right? And that's what I'm discovering more and more, that there's the path of where you can wear shields and, and have all these degrees and you're untouchable on some level. And then there's another path that maybe people are less prone to go to because it is dangerous. There are ways that people can perceive you and understand you. And I'm going, I'm trying to encourage us to go from incubation to full production to this dangerous path of sharing a story because that's how people begin to remember us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard because it's not, to put yourself forward, it's not always the most valued. Mm -hmm. And now uh, Peter Akisel is uh, joining us, uh, who is a professor of theater here, who also at twice started and said, you know, this would be a great uh, uh, selection um, for our play. We just spoke about uh, Victor's own uh, past working in this theater, uh, about his theater company. Uh, he, he's working since a year and a half. He's on the, the head of it. So, um, but uh, maybe um, we'll come to the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit, in the field of Asian theater or theater writing, um, where does it uh, fit in? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just apologize for not being here for the reading itself. I, I was actually teaching until four o'clock, but um, of course I've, I've seen the reading. I've seen a reading of this play several times. And, uh, so when Frank asked me to suggest a Japanese play for the reading series, I thought of this play both because of its themes, but also because of its popularity. I mean, one of the interesting things about Wishing Chong and his work is that he is a Korean Japanese, uh, and, and I'll talk about that, that, that positioning, I guess, in a minute. But he's a playwright who's actually very popular and very mainstream. His work is very successful. Um, he's among a small, uh, I think, cohort of living writers in Japan who essentially earn a reasonable living from writing for uh, plays and for television. He's written in film, he's written screenplays and television as well. Um, this play, when, when he um, spoke about this play, he was asked why he wrote the play, and he, he's a very um, subtle person. He's uh, uh, not, a, not, a, not an outspoken uh, person. And he, he very subtly said, well, I wanted to have the smell of Korean barbecue on the stage of the National Theatre of Japan. Um, and in saying that, I think he's pointing us to a number of uh, uh, kind of cultural, politi political uh, locations for this work. The, the first one is himself and his family history. He comes uh, from uh, a, a historical situation in Japan where many Koreans were uh, brought to Japan forcibly during uh, prior to and during World War II to work uh, in armaments factories and in, in some instances in uh, war support um, uh, uh, industries and um, sex industries and so on and so forth. Um, and many of those people after the war stayed in Japan, but they had very um, ambiguous uh, um, uh, national status and so in a sense they're, they're kind of between subjects and to this day uh, the, the people who are children and children and grandchildren of those people uh, uh, very often have been brought up in Japan, speak Japanese, have no uh, connection to Korea but are st still definite uh, by definition Korean citizens and they, they've not been able to get Japanese passports for example and uh, and they experience uh, quite a lot of discrimination. Um, and so Korean uh, Japanese people will often change their name to a Japanese name and in a sense hide their Koreanness um, uh, because you know, they're discrimin they find discrimination in the workplace. Uh, there's discrimination among uh, families when marriages take place and so on. Um, so Wishing Chong is among a generation of, and, and perhaps we could say that this situation has improved for Korean Japanese over the years because Wishing Chong is somebody who uh, is quite open about his Koreanness. He's somebody who's also very successful. And he moves in kind of mainstream entertainment and media circles as a Korean Japanese. 
But there is, I mean, that's, that's to say that people are coming to terms with this 50 years later. Uh, but there is still significant um, uh, administrative uh, uh, problems to be in that, uh, you know, in between state in relation to questions of, uh, of your uh, legal status as a citizen, your ability to, well, not ability to own property, but your ability to pass property on to the next generation. Um, and so, him saying that I wanted to have the smell of Korean barbecue on the stage of the National Theatre is to bring the reality of his Koreanness to this emblematic site. And, you know, the, the word kokoditsu or national uh, is, uh, you know, it, we, we don't want to overplay the way that, that which the word national, or, um, um, I mean, if you look at this construction of the word national in Japanese language using the characters for country and people, uh, many people will criticise the word and say that it, it is, has too many associations with pre-war nationalist ideas of the, the, the nation being a kind of collective being. Um, so sites like the National Theatre become quite uh, uh, interesting political sites for artists to uh, inhabit but also interrogate the meaning of. Um, Korean barbecue, I'm sure you, you've been to Korean restaurants and had Korean barbecue. It's a really delicious form of cooking at the table. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about this is that this is a Korean barbecue restaurant that specializes in, uh, in what the, the Japanese call the guts. So it's all the um, bits that uh, would normally be the cheap, the intestines, the tendons, the um, which uh, an acquired taste to many people who, who uh, don't enjoy that kind of food, but to uh, um, uh, many Korean and, and indeed Chinese and Japanese people, this is some of the best bits of, of, uh, of the food. But it's also the food that is, is cheap food. It's the food that's discarded. So it's obviously food that has been consumed by poor people over, over the years. And a Korean barbecue restaurant that serves the guts uh, would in, in this place setting be, a, be, a, be a, a restaurant for poor people, and in particular, poor Koreans. Um, we might now, in postmodern Tokyo, go to a guts restaurant with, you know, very kind of gentrified and a kind of very kind of uh, elaborate cooking experience. But that's not to say that the roots of this food is very proletarian. Um, and there's this whole question of uh, smell. The politics of smell in Japan is quite complicated, but going to a Korean restaurant involves imb imbibing this very strong smoky smell and then walking out and that being in your clothes. So, um, so you, you, know, you, can, you can tell when a person's been to a Korean barbecue restaurant because uh, they walk out with the smell of the food on their bodies. And you, you've probably heard about Japanese people wanting to Baths and you know it's 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 a society that generally speaking um, um, uh, doesn't like strong smells. But, um, uh, so people bathe and they you know they're very clean and they, and so this is in a sense using this series of cultural prohibitions, if you like, um, as a, as a way of framing uh, a play that has become a very popular play. It's a it's a play that appeals to a mass audience. It's a play that played very successfully in Tokyo. Uh, and then uh, there was also a very successful version of it done in Seoul. And so then it became a vehicle uh, for, in a sense, certain kind of reconciliation between uh, South Koreans and Japanese because the, the, the very long traumatic history of uh, Korea-Japan relations is uh, traumatically unresolved from the wartime period. Um, so you know that's that's what, how we get this uh, this idea of the, the smell of Korean barbecue on the on the on the national theatre stage. Um, and, and was it did they grill on stage? Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a feature of the play that you actually you know it's a kind of foodorama kind of experience that you you actually participate in the in the experience of, of the cooking. Um, yeah, Victor, this play, you. Obviously, you know Love Appeal, that you've directed many readings here with Aspen, with other uh, theatres. What is your reaction to the play? You didn't know it before. I didn't know it before, but I've 
have you gone to Korean barbecue restaurants? Mm. Right? And I say that in 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 the way that it, the place a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know Korean barbecue. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Mm -hmm. And suddenly this thing that you think you know and understand literally gives you some other sort of guts mm -hmm. to step into the world of the play, right? And I think that's, that's part of the genius of the play. Mm -hmm. We know the shop, we know the sort of food, and then you go into the molecular structure of what it is, and then it's both the glory of it and then it's slow erosion, right? And I think that's, that's what I actually find really compelling about the play, mm. because it is populist. Mm. Mm. But then it's a, at some particular point, it, it, just on a very guttural level, you begin to, it changes, it's certainly with me, it just begin to change me of what, when you begin to experience these folks who, what <coughs> is wrong for these folks, mm. Mm. right? And, and so that's for me the, one of the most compelling things, yeah. mm -hmm. the gateway into the play. Yeah, that's a very good comment. So would you see an audience for this, for this um, you know, in the, in the theater career and in the, in the US, do you think it is something that's transferable as it was from Japan to Korea and to Seoul, is it? I could say yes, but maybe I don't know enough about it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Because the thing that I was thinking about, folks, is I wonder if what images came to you when you were listening to the play, if, if, if you found pockets in your life that reflected this situation in the States or wherever that is, that's actually for me the question for the spectator, right? Um, and I didn't know then what the range would be between the authenticity of the play, and then the translation experience for the, for the American audience. So maybe that's a cop out. Yeah, maybe but we could uh, maybe we could ask some audience I members. I think it's or... absolutely brilliant and it's wonderful, and they should do a full production here in New York. It's a wonderful, wonderful theatrical experience. I've always thought the play would work really well for Western audiences too. Um, I think it's you know it's first and foremost a human drama. It's about families. Uh, and it's about place. Um, and I think those questions are, in a sense, universal questions. So who did the translation? Um, I know we've got some questions, but I'll just very quickly mention the translator, because I know he'd like to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, his name is Philip Flavin, and um, uh, there's a, the challenge to translate this play is that it's, it's written uh, in a very colloquial uh, style of uh, Japanese, because it's set in Osaka. And first of all, uh, Kanto and Kansai, the two regions of Japan that have different accents. And Kanto is the Tokyo region, and Tokyo uh, is, is now the national dialect of Japan. So it's, if, you know, if you learn Japanese, that's the dialect you learn. Uh, it's the dialect if you listen to NHK, the national broadcaster, the news will be read in, in Tokyo dialect. Osaka has its own history and its own colloquialisms. And, uh, and then it's inflected through the Korean. So it's a kind of, it's a, it, you know, there's a, lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of jokes around the use of language here, coarse language, uh, um, uh, colloquialisms, and also even swearing and things. So the challenge is how to translate that into English. Philip's an American who ironically uh, is a, uh, a, a shamisen player. So he spent all his time in Japan learning classical Japanese music, uh, in, you know, really immersed in a very, you know, in, in a world that's pre 20th century. And then he actually came to Melbourne where I was formerly working. And he ended up working for me as a research assistant on a project that I had on 20th century drama. And then this play opportunity came up and we needed somebody to translate it. And I said, well, you translate it if, if you're interested. And it turns out he's a natural translator. And he, you know, he, even though he is, you know, I mean, if he's immersed in traditional Japanese arts, uh, he had a real taste for the performative, I think. And uh, so, you know, the translation, I think, is very good. That was the first question that we had, the yeah. first major hurdle. How do we handle the language yeah. and to relate, relate it to this audience? Yeah. Today? yeah. Right. 
And how did you handle it in the, the Melbourne? Melbourne. Well, the Melbourne play, I mean, in a sense, Philip wrote it, the translation was kind of written for a Melbourne audience. Right. So there are some Australianisms in there. Even though he's American, he, he spent a lot of time in Australia and he's used them right. uh, to kind of use a, a, a kind of local, bring a kind of local flavour. So I think what, what would happen, I think, if you were to do the play here is you would find kind of New York equivalents. You know, because New York has a fascinating history of language as well, and you could use some really interesting kind of flavours from that language as well. So, um, but yeah, the language is fruity, and what we'd say in, in you know in Australia, fruity meaning a bit a bit smelly, um, uh, 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 and uh, and and lively and joyful uh, and earthy. You know, so. um, we have two questions. Uh, one for you, no, then you after me. And I have a question which. Maybe there's many different answers, and I want to address it to both of you, the specialist and the director, is the question about male and female in play, and how they cope with this identity crisis. It seemed to me, and I, that's sort of what I wanted to ask you about, that, that the men failed to, to cope with this. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, Tokyo was sitting in front of me, is mm -hmm. sort of the prime example of that, but all the men in one way or another mm -hmm. failed. Well, the women find strategies for mm. for for uh, uh, to, to find solutions which are not perfect, mm. but anyway enables their lives to go on in a different way from 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 the male characters. And I wanted to ask you, if, mm. what, what do you think about such a mm. division in the play, or such a identity politics, and how that also plays out? somewhat differently in an American context, which is not modeled typically on such a division. I might answer the second, because I think you'd have a, it would be interesting to respond to the challenge of directing that first, right. I think. I think the main question that I have is when you have a lack of resources, when actually you're dealing with substantive a situation and resources are diminishing. What happens if we're trying to deal with psychological truths is I think instead of feeling that way, one would actually create an infrastructure of class, of power. And I think for me, I don't know if this quite answers your question, how do they begin to handle this oppression of this reality within the encasement of the shop? And so what I believe happens, and, and I don't know if I have enough of the nuance, I believe they create a, a caste system, even within this, this deteriorating place. Right? And that is the survival, because really the truth of the matter is they have nothing. And a lot of it is, is just a projection or a construction of what it could be. And, and I think actually, I don't know how to divide it up between male and female quite yet, but that's my first impulse, is I'm gonna create a construct here, so even it's a betterment of something else, uh, better, uh, a betterment over someone else, uh, some other sort of power play. That would be my first instinct, and I think that's what we were trying to achieve today. The, the, the way I would answer it is slightly more sociological. Um, and I think that Chong, Wishing Chong is, is a, remember that he's a writer who writes for the mainstream. And I think he's playing into a trope within mainstream theatre and film about the, uh, the image of the suffering woman, which it appeals to audiences in Japan quite strongly. So if you go to uh, all these films, or you go to post-war narratives of suffering, that the trope of the suffering woman and the, and in a sense the, the 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 traumatic male who can't cope is is one that's repeated in 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 a number of different stories. Um, you know, from a feminist perspective, there's an ideological dimension there that you know Japan always depicts the woman as strong and ready to sacrifice everything for the family. Uh, this is a narrative that is embedded in the national curriculum, for example, if you want to read about Japanese education systems. But it's also a narrative that is embedded in traditional um, 
constructions of the Japanese family. Um, matrilineality exists within the home. The, the woman controls the domestic space and the male is attempting, is supposed to navigate the world. But if the male can't do that, if the male's broken, well then they, they do, you know, they have high incidence and breakdown. Yeah, if they drink, you know, they drink or they... So that's, but I think, whether, consciously or not, I think Chong's, wishing Chong is, is really very much going to a very known uh, uh, genre, if you like, of performance there, that, it, that people are very responsive to. It could be a little bit sentimental. Uh, Japanese audiences are quite sentimental. Maybe one more, one more question. Um, this is a technical rather than a cultural question. I'm also a playwright, but I've never used such a large canvas. Now, when you're staging something like this, and you've got all of these groups, do you have you staged this ever? No. You haven't. Have you seen it staged? Though? I have seen it staged, yeah. And are, is everyone on stage? Are there lights? How do they do it? There's a chorus, these three or four guys in the back. How is it done? How was it done there? Well, how it was done, I think, is very similar to the way that uh, epic theatre like, ah, is done. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, that, that may well be an artistic decision, but there's also something very pragmatic that epic enables you to do the tableau, to do the to, to do the arrangement of things uh -huh. on stage, like. Right? Uh -huh. So it's a, in a sense, it's a good solution to a problem. Um, but but I'd be very I'm, you know I'm a dramaturg in in the artistic world yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than a director so I, I'd be much more interested in having you answer that question as a director. Yeah. I, I, I think for me it just would have to do with the series of encasements what's what's in the central space and and the surround um, because but people would be moving in other words groups would be moving or how would you. I think that I think that's a that's a viable answer. For me, I would go back to I wonder what the relationships would be in Japan, of what of what contained spaces might be, you know. And and for me, it's that sense of spatial relationships uh -huh. because it's about nearness, yeah. uh -huh. right? It's about on some level also a, a bit of osmosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be for me the first question. Yeah. You, you have a, a, a very, in a sense, a very convenient um, transference from the real world to the theatrical world in, in the image of the tatami mat, because in a, in a Korean barbecue restaurant, the arrangement is always around the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the table. Uh, uh. Um, so in a sense, you can actually delineate space and light that space in a very, really contained way by having the table and the arrangement uh, it's a very known uh, uh, orchestration of bodies. So immediately you're creating little mini theatre worlds um, on, the, on the stage. I think and you've got potential to do that. Um, yeah. And also you have the history of kabuki theatre. Wide, long stages with, uh, you know, with, with not so much depth, but lots of lateral possibility. So you can tell a sort of story along a kind of linear narrative across the stage. Um, so again, that's also an influence that you can draw on. And I think that's what appeals to me and why I say it's like a Trojan horse. Yeah. Yeah. The barbecue, the stereotypes of men and women, what does the space say? And then you can do, have some of these reverses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a fascinating uh, way to, to, to have a conversation with the mainstream audience. But uh, I think this is one of the best things one can hope for that we already think about then the staging because the play is so engaging and we really uh, would like, I would like to see it. I think it's a, a, a quite a, a engaging a portrait and we really spent some time with a Korean Japanese uh, family and there are devastating uh, events in life, but also from humans. So very, very much uh, almost like a Greek family of kings and people falling <laughs> apart, even though they are right. the poorest of the poor. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, uh, again, it's a case how theater and the theater play, you know, even translated, can make us, you, us close and understand the world better, where we're coming from, where we're going to, and find our own uh, relations to that. Just think about my family, my very small German yeah. town, my father was, you know, had to leave the 
part of Silesia, and it was, you know, they were in the World War II afterward, math, and uh, so I think this is quite a, a wonderful uh, work and a great, uh, great uh, attribution to the, the World Voices we have here in the festival. I think if you have another question, maybe you can ask them uh, right here, but we have to move on, and the next play is going to come soon. Thank you again for coming. <laughs> If you plan to stay for the next yeah. one, yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see the reason. Uh, 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 you did a fantastic two to four.